Hello everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar. On behalf of BIS Research, I would like to welcome you to our webinar on mental health wellness in a post pandemic world. This is Swati Sood, lead analyst for healthcare practice at BIS Research. I will be the moderator for today's event. Today, we are hosting three of the finest spines who have been working in the mental health industry. We have Clive S. Michelson, who is a psychologist, founder and CEO of My eHealth. He is passionate about employee sustainability and preventive health. As Clive puts it, we are in the business of making happy bubbles and happy bubbles are not only productive and innovative, but also fun to work with. We also have our mm -hmm. guest speaker, Laura Scarone Bonham, a consultant psychologist, head of mental health services, Teladoc Health, UK and Ireland. She leads a team of 80 psychologists, counselors and psychotherapists delivering remote mental health support to clients across the lifespan. We also have host speaker Abhishek Sanyal, Senior Research Analyst for Healthcare Practice at BIS Research. He holds a profound experience in market intelligence studies on various healthcare technologies. I thank all of the esteemed panelists for their gracious presence. A very warm welcome to all of you. In the following 60 Thank minutes, in the following 60 minutes, we are all keen to learn from your experience about mental health wellness in a pandemic. At the end of this session, we will gain a brief understanding of the overall mental health scenario and emerging devices and platform in the space. In today's session, speakers will be focusing on particulars such as impact of COVID-19 pandemic, ways to promote mental health and prevent mental illness, benefits of remote delivery therapy, gender, sexual and relationship diversity, challenges for the new entrants in the mental health devices market, evolving demand for mental health technologies and solutions and emerging solutions, devices and platforms for treatment. Towards the end of the discussion, I will open the panel to the audience for questions. I would request the listeners to kindly type the questions in the chat and I will be happy to pass the questions to the speaker towards the end of the session. Also, I would request everyone in the audience to kindly mute your phones during the session. Thank you everyone for your patience and let us get started. Let's have the thought on the overall mental health scenario and emerging devices and platforms in the space from Abhishek. Over to you, Abhishek. All right, thank you, Swati. So what is mental health? The World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which an individual realizes his or her abilities, can cope with normal stresses of life, can work productively, and can contribute to his or her community. Over the years, the definition of mental health has aided in moving away from the prior considerations and thought process, which essentially identified mental health as a state of absence of mental illness. So being the complex subject that it is, further modifications to this definition can also be expected as our understanding of the concept evolves. Next slide, please. So what are the factors propelling the demand for emerging mental health devices and platforms? Now, the evolution of the quality of treatment and mental health devices is propelled by our increasing understanding of the subject and more focus on personal well-being. Right? We must keep in mind that the changes brought about in the market have been significantly accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we have seen is essentially a couple of years worth of growth in the digital space happen in a few quarters. Uh, 
We have witnessed slightly over 30% growth in the reporting of symptoms and anxiety by adults in 2021 compared to the pre-COVID-19 scenario. So that's 41.1% compared to 11%. We have seen a four-fold growth in the number of funding activities. The adoption of digital solutions for healthcare in emerging countries is also growing. During 2021 to 2030, we expect a CAGR growth of 29.37% for emerging mental health devices and platforms in emerging countries and regions. Lastly, but not the least, we have pharma companies entering into business synergies, which will play a key role in shaping the future development in this space. Next slide. So let's talk about the components of digital mental health landscape. Connectivity is at the core of the technology landscape and digital solutions are transforming mental health care. Going forward, we'll see more of connected devices and mobile platforms. The consumer base for the same is also expected to expand. We'll see an increasing number of mobile applications for improving thinking skills. Expect new business models by new entrants in the market to monetize these services. Data analytics. This is where AI will be at the heart of services. Machine learning and AI technologies will drastically improve our capability to handle and analyze data. Inclusion of digital mental health services and insurance will be driven by increased partnerships between insurance companies and mental health platforms. Insurance providers are also expected to witness growth in their customer base. And finally, digital management capabilities for mental health disabilities. These are also expected to be beneficial in lowering the cost of mental health disability claims. Next slide. Let's talk about the regional market landscape. So what we have here is a regional summary of the market adoption of emerging mental health devices and platforms shown by these two charts. The market for these devices and platforms is expected to be valued at over 18 billion by the end of 2030. North America will be a key market for these devices. The overall adoption rate during 2021 and 2030 is expected to grow at a CAGR of 24.7%. On the right hand side, we have four quadrants indicating the relative market positioning of different countries in terms of their expected growth rates for 2021 to 2030. That's the X axis and the Y axis is the market shares in 2020. Barring the US, we see that all of the key countries represent high growth markets. Next slide. Next slide, please. All right, so let's talk about the leading players in the market. Essentially, this represents the tier structure indicating the positioning of different companies in the emerging mental health devices and platform space. These tiers are differentiated in terms of the relative market shares of the companies. So any top new entrant in the future will first enter the third tier, that is tier three, and then make its way up. Similarly, the companies that are currently in tiers two and three are expected to make their way up through the tiers with capability enhancement and growth in consumer base. Over to you, Swati. Thank you, Abhishek. Admitting this, let us understand how has the COVID-19 impacted the overall mental health ecosystem. I would like to invite Laura to provide her insights regarding the same. Over to you, Laura. Thank you, Swasi. So I would like us to think about how mental health was a key issue that we should have been considering even before the pandemic. For me, it's quite interesting to think about how psychology is a empirical science that developed at the end of the 19th century. And at the time, it sort of made sense to divide physical and mental health as two different elements. But over 170 years have passed and we still are conceiving humans where through this divisive line and trying to reach and, and support one or the other areas. So I would like to ask to the audience, what do you think it would be the impact of removing this invisible line and start uh, conceiving individuals in a holistic manner? What would be the impact in terms of the quality of care, in terms of the design and development of healthcare services? And what would be the impact 
impact for practitioners who perhaps would have to study in a lot more holistic manner. So I think that this would be a, a disruption to the market that would be revolutionary in the way that we conceive uh, health for individuals. Um, for this reason, I would like you to, to consider these questions. So what do we know? We know that before the pandemic, one in every six people already struggle with common mental health conditions and depression was already the second leading cause of disability worldwide. Next slide, please. And so what has happened since COVID started? There has been a big impact in different areas of everyone's life from a economic uh, situation where many people have lost their jobs and their stability in that sense. Uh, their physical health may have been affected. Psychologically, it has been hard on all of us to be in periods of isolation or no longer be able to you know, touch a friend, hug a friend. Um, and we must not forget that uh, 4.5 million people have died over the course of the pandemic. And this is not only the individuals that we have sadly lost, but the family members who are grieving their absence. And so another element that I would like us to think about is the development of long COVID. This would, I will assume, will start being considered a condition uh, we are observing in the UK more and more. And by low COVID, we mean individuals that after 12 weeks from the diagnosis, they continue to experience persistent symptoms, which has been listed in this slide. What we know is that in the UK, about 1 million people have reported that they are experiencing long COVID symptoms. And we know that from that population, 67% say that this is really making their life more difficult and that they're struggling to cope with their day-to-day -day life. So I think we, we are about to see a different kind, a new kind of disability that we don't know very much about. So I would urge you to keep your eyes open for it. Next slide, please. So since the pandemic started, uh, if you remember only a couple of slides ago, you know, the rates have doubled and now it's no longer one in six people that experience common mental health conditions, but one in three. Um, this is quite alarming and it was even more alarming to know that 93% of countries saw their mental health services being suspended or interrupted. So who is looking after all the individuals that are really struggling and are really in need of help? What alarms me the most is that these delays or suspension of system means that a lot of people are going to be faced with growing waiting lists to access support, which will mean a crystallization of the difficulties that they experience for their mental health, making them more complex. So acting rapidly is, is something of utmost importance. In terms of the vulnerable populations, we know that primarily children and young people were one of the most vulnerable. These are pretty important years of their life where they should have been developing socially, developing their identity, their ability to self-suit, to make friends. And all of this has been paused as well as academically. Uh, we have had to change the criteria that we used to evaluate children that haven't been able to go into school. Um, as well, healthcare professionals have put, you know, the needs of other people to their own detriment. And we see in high rates of burnout within this population population. And lastly, minorities, as always, have struggled to access services. Thank you. Next slide. And I think that with that, I will be passing to Clive. Thanks, Laura. Um, yes, you're absolutely right there. The, uh, the constraints on the, on the business and within mental health have been really quite large this last period, especially through COVID. If you look just through the COVID period, you can see the disruption. 61% of the countries have reported, according to the, you know, the World Health Organization, 61% of the countries have uh, reported uh, disruptions in their service, and 3% of those are totally disrupted, which is really quite... Uh, um, an alarming number when you think of the uh, the pool of need out there. Um, if you look at neurological services, then that's around at 33% with 2% fully closed, right? One thing when I was looking at some of these numbers, if you look at the, the graph in the top right, you see little asterisks there against high income. So if you look at those services that are actually disrupted and have more disruption, those with high income level uh, countries and, and areas have more disruption 
And that is actually quite alarming because that's not what we expected. We would have expected this to be in the low income community. Um, and it's not that case. Uh, next slide. Thank you. There are, if you look at the disruptive services, there are a number of key areas that are actually quite important to look at. Firstly, if you think about England alone, just through the, the uh, March to August of 2020, 235,000 visits were missed in mental health uh, and lost, right? And that is a huge impact on, on people's mental health. But if you look at some of these disrupted areas, you can see part of them were, were with school and mental health programs at school, work-related mental health programs, another one, interventions for caregivers. Caregivers obviously have had a huge burden uh, in uh, servicing people with COVID and uh, their ability to, to maintain their hel a healthy environment without burning out and uh, losing total frustration in the way that uh, they have to work is uh, a mental health challenge for us, not just now, but also in the future. Psychotherapy and counseling services and interventions are also impacted by this disruption. Clinical harm and restructuring um, reduction services have been uh, interrupted and suicide prevention. Uh, is another large one that has also shown a spike during this period. Next slide, please. If you look also at antidepressive use, just in the last uh, the, qu the quarter between October to December in the UK, they issued almost one million more antidepressive medications. That's a six percent increase from the, the the same quarter between 19 and 20. That's a huge increase. If you look at the the the, the, the uh, graph on the right, you'll see at the the top of the the lead leading the pack in Europe anyway is Portugal, and which is very um, uh, surprising to to us all. But uh, Portugal has um, twelve point four people out of every hundred people walking by your window will be consuming antidepressive medications. Um, that's quite alarming. Um, Sweden obviously is up there as well at a very high rate of 10.2 people in Sweden um, uh, eating anti consuming antidepressants on a daily basis. Global depression and the drug markets have reached $12.7 billion in 2020, and the antidepressive market is $26 billion. This is uh, an alarming number, which we should be uh, also thinking about because in the absence of therapy, people seem to be using uh, a lot of pills, right? Uh, and uh, we need to try to find out a proactive way and a preventive way for introducing therapy to people long before it's too late. Next slide, please. If you look at the depress depression in, in 2020 um, and both pre and post COVID, the, the um, graph on the right hand side and the top right, you'll see a large increase in uh, depressors, depression in, uh, in that period. If the, the graph on the bottom right is for, anti uh, for anxiety. So in both of these graphs, you can see the, uh, a huge increase in percentage of people affected by uh, both depression and anxiety. The OECD reported also that th this crisis has obviously incre increased and um, there are not many people getting that help either. So the prevalence of anxiety and, and uh, depression have doubled in many of these countries. The risk factors obviously associated with this are far greater than I'm um, just financial insecurity, unemployment and fear. But these obviously are factors uh, associated uh, a lot with, with anxiety. All these normal protectors that we have in society with social connectiveness, employment, education, engagement, access to physical exercise, daily routines, uh, um, access to healthcare services, all of these things have been lacking and the accessibility has, has uh, fallen away. And this is why also online mental health and online healthcare is, a, is, is an important way to, to take up that challenge to, to improve accessibility. Next slide, please. Well explained, Laura and Clive. What are your thoughts, Clive, on the evolving demand for mental health technologies and solutions? Over to you, Clive. Well, um, 
the demand let's start with the demand for for for, for this uh not just my previous slides which i've spoken about but this slide here also is about suicide so if you look at the rates of suicide on the on the world graph on the, on the bottom left this is the um, the amount of suicides uh, in ratio between men and women that means that men have a higher degree in the red that's four times as many suicides for men than there are for women the uh, the orange is three times three to three point nine nine so this is an alarming rate that should statistically be telling us something in mental health. Why are men committing suicide far greater than uh, in a far greater ratio than men? If you look at suicides, also uh, global suicides um, um, for low and and um, high income countries, which is the graph on the top right, you can see it, this is also an alarming rate based on the age. You can see the suicide rate skyrockets. Uh, between the ages of uh, 20 to uh, to uh, 45, right? That's really high up there. If you look at the scale in the bottom uh, the bottom uh, right, there you can see the difference between orange, which is females, and yellow, which are males, in the suicide rates compared to the um, uh, between males and females. Another statistic which is quite large. Next slide, please. Another demand for us for mental health services in the world is not just all the issues that I the previous slides that I've shown you, but it's also drug use, in uh, and self medication, which I, I I usually refer to in uh, currently in the world, according to the United uh, um, World Health Organization, 359 million people consume drugs on a daily basis. It's not just a prescription drugs, this is also illegal drugs, cannabis, opioids, opiates, cocaine, amphetamines, and ecstasy, and these kinds of things. This is an extremely alarming figure. Why are so many people in the world, almost 360 million people consuming drugs so often? What are the causes? What are the things that are causing these people to, to turn to, to medication or other causes, uh, types of medication, legal medications as well, in order to treat their symptoms. If you look on the, the graph on the right, um, high in income countries have always have been consuming some of these types of drugs before because they've been quite expensive. But what's actually alarming now is that low income countries have an increase of drug rate from up to 43% in, in, uh, um, in this period now. And in 2030, it's going to be even worse. Next slide, please. Yale came out with a report that was published in Harvard Business Review, and that's the picture that is on the right. Uh, and it showed that this was pre-COVID. It showed that one in five of your motivated employees was going to burn out during the year. This is also an alarming aspect because it's part of causal aspect of everything we're talking about in prevention. If one in one in five of your motivated employees, that means the employees actually that are that are doing a lot of the uh, the, the tasks and are always volunteering to do stuff at work, if one in five of those people are going to burn out, then this is a, a huge um, a wake up call for some companies. If you look at the, the picture in the middle, this is a report actually delivered by um, Deloitte, which came out in January of 2020. And it showed the, uh, the increased need for uh, preventive solutions. And that preventive solutions actually can give you a return on investment. And that return on investment, say if you, for every dollar that you spend on uh, preventive health, you will actually receive $5 back. And uh, my eHealth actually has uh, statistics to prove the same. Next slide, please. Great. What are the ways to promote mental health and prevent mental illness? Over to you, Laura. Thank you. So actually, I would like us to sort of think back a year and a half ago when the when the pandemic started and really what is it that has happened with the uh, mental health landscape from a practitioner's 
point of view. At the time, I can give you my experience. I was uh, working in a in-person service, delivering therapy day to day. And one thing to another, we were told that we were going home, that we weren't going to come back to the office. We had a workload of clients, maybe 20, 30 clients, depending on the person. And we were told that, uh, you know, that day we would have to uh, decide how is it that we're going to support these people? What are the medium that we can use to continue to carry out our psychotherapeutic work? And I think that if it wasn't because of the pandemic, a lot of people within the psychological profession and the mental health profession wouldn't have been pushed to this area. It would have, uh, you know, sworn that this doesn't work and that it's not the same, they're sitting in a room with another person. However, research already establishes uh, that that's not quite true. In fact, video uh, conference uh, therapy and telephone delivery therapy has been shown to be as effective as in-person therapy. The only challenges from the practitioner point of view is that you have to reimagine how is it that you create those connections with the person how is it that you create that digital intimacy to help individuals open up uh, in relation to the things that are hurting them and so also some of the technical issues have been around how to manage the digital confidentiality and this is both because we will be sending highly sensible information to our clients about the causes of therapy or the disclosure but also how can we manage from the client point of view that they wouldn't have family members around and that they would respect that space as something that we have designed for them? Well, uh, we have learned and adapted and now there are a number of uh, guides and techniques that we can use. However, I would like to emphasize that we don't have yet enough research. We need more to understand really how is it that these interventions are working? What are the key techniques? Um, in terms of looking after the therapies, where, as we say, if now one in three people are experiencing mental health conditions, calculate how many mental health professionals do you need to support them to feel better, to give them skills to manage. Well, that's a lot of us. And I would say that, you know, it's also a risk for us to overwork. Since we are working from home, we tend to long wor uh, work longer hours. Identity and self-worth should not equate to productivity. And so we need to be aware of issues such such as burnout, emotional contagion, and this is a phenomenon by which you cannot separate the emotions of the kind from your own. Compassion fatigue, well, it reaches a point where your compassion sort of, you know, bursts, breaks, and you struggle to truly care and connect to the needs of your client. And even secondary traumatic stress disorder, which is that through experiences of your clients which have been truly traumatizing, you feel so affected that you are unable to work or you're getting flashbacks of this. Next slide, please. And so what can we do, you know, as individuals, as if you are any head of department, if you have a role of responsibility within your company, or even if you are just any other person, please do go and talk to your line managers about things that your company could do for you. But first, on an individual basis, I think that try and strive for that life-work balance. Try to decide what are the things that make you happy, fulfill outside of work, and work on those as well as part of who you are and what brings you joy. Challenge that duality between body and mind. You know, if your leg was hurting, you would not hesitate to go to the doctor. And uh, this is the same. Simply, you know, we will be faced with a number of challenges in our life, and that is okay there are periods of life where uh, you know we might be more susceptible to experiencing mental health conditions like uh, during early parenting years after pregnancy uh, menopause and that is okay to acknowledge and to seek help so do not be afraid in terms of your company I think that we should all encourage companies to provide accessibility to health packages that support mental health conditions and there should be elements where we signal to all the workers that this is okay to experience and it's okay to talk about so promote mental health events uh, assign mental health champions and for mental health first aiders next please so this is to Clive thanks again Laura yeah then I'll just follow on with everything you've been saying which is really was really good because not just um, treatment and uh, rehab, there's also prevention within the system. And the majority of the rehab goes through something you can say is a symptomatic and a retroactive model. It means somebody's already sick. So 
we need to maybe in the mental health facility, we need to environment, we need to think about how can we find these things before they happen? How can we we measure them and, and identify the risk exposure and then create a solution for those persons before that happens? So at my health, what we try to do is we try to look at symptomatic causal and self-awareness and how they fit into that preventive uh, um, and prevention area and how we can empower individuals as uh, um, Swati said in the beginning, we like to make happy bubbles because everything is about how people can learn to manage their environment in their bubble and within within, within the, the parameters of, of their abilities, obviously. Uh, company screening was a huge Im importance to do to, in order to, to measure that exposure rate that you might have. And that is, you can say, it helps you to the in the, the, the first stage of all medical practice or in the need when when the need is and the demand is uh, is high you need to practice triage you need to understand how do we help the most people how do we get into those aspects and screening is the only way to do that and then how to applicably uh, set accessibility requirements based upon the needs of that person so this can be done online it can be done through multimodal teams online and or both the measure, measurements and the proactive support can be done that way through health coaching, mind and body, as Laura was talking about, holistic health coaching to understand the greater picture affecting the individual within their, their environment and how to, to help to make them happy persons within that environment. It's not about what everyone else's needs might be it's about trying to focus on what that individual needs within their environment so situational empowerment and awareness are just keys to all of this online psychotherapy absolutely uh, really important next slide please it is good to know clive and laura how are gender sexual and relationship diversity are in relation to mental health what is your opinion laura Thank you, Sothi. So I, I wanted to particularly bring this, this issue because all minorities in general are disadvantaged in life just by social exclusion and discrimination. And so what we know is that particularly in this moment of uh, mental health crisis, you know, we need to look after those that struggle to look after themselves. So in the case of minorities, and by this I mean individuals belonging to the LGBTQI community. This is for those of you who are not aware of these letters, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, intersex, and so on. That is any gender or sexual minorities. Anyone that belongs to religious minorities, ethnic minorities, individuals who have disabilities, uh, who, as Clive was saying before, you know, live in poverty and do not have the same economic means to access the same opportunities, all of them are going to be subject to what we call minority stress. This is all of these experiences of being different, being treated different by others, accumulating and increasing the risk to experiencing suicidal ideation, substance misuse, risk of homelessness, uh, social exclusion and so on. Hate crime rates are also increasing uh, by almost 15% since 2015 in the UK. This is very concerning for us. What I would like to say is that there is nothing innate to individuals belonging to all of these communities that would cause them to experience this, but it's the social exclusion and discrimination that is uh, uh, promoting this. So it is our responsibility to remove these barriers. We have a social responsibility to support people accessing same opportunities. Um, for the LGBTQI people, digital therapy, I think, has been particularly important for individuals who might not be safe going out on the streets, for individuals who uh, might be in the process of transitioning with a gender identity and they're very early and afraid of going out. Uh, I think digital therapy has been tremendously helpful. However, there is a lack of training on mental health professionals to know how to support minorities, how to treat them like anyone else, and how to be sufficiently informed to be sensitive to their needs. 
And so there have been added psychological challenges for trans and non-binary people who have transitioned during the course of the pandemic. And so, as I was saying earlier, the impact of having paused these services means that individuals are now waiting for two, four, even six years to access the hormones, the surgery that they so desperately need. Um, so we need to be aware of, of these increased rates in suicidal thoughts. Next one, please. And so again, as a colleague in your company, as a line manager, as a head of services, CEO, whatever your position is, you know, bringing this, this social responsibility to support individuals belonging to minorities. I would say invest in consultants simply to have a look at your forms, how are you reflecting the, the gender identity of different people? How are you supporting uh, those who are in, in queer families? You know, how is it that you are considering that we are all different. Ensure that you have an inclusive environment. So for example, using gender neutral toilets, uh, we all have in the same function, you are urinating, do we really need a separate cubicle? Um, do not make assumptions about people's identities and feel free to ask what is the preferred name that I can use for you? What are your pronouns? This is just going to signal that you are welcome enough people who are different to you. And use neutral language. Again, we want to bridge those divisions that make us think so opposedly men from women. We are not that different. And so, uh, as we were saying with mental health, celebrate Diversity Days, Pride Month. We have coming up there now in October, uh, in, in invest in training and assign LGBTQI champions for your organization. Next one, please. That's for you, Clive. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Absolutely, diversity is 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 integral to all good support, and uh, we we should hope that everybody is uh, practicing diversity and treating everybody uh, equally and giving them the the right um, respect that one deserves. When it comes to male and female, I'm going to bring this up. I know there uh, there's an ex. Uh, uh, sex as well, but I'm talking about male and female and the difference between and the stigma which Laura brought up. There is a huge stigma in seeking mental health, especially if you're male, because males are taught from a very young age that you have to be resilient. You have to man up. You've got to just take it and, and, and work hard and that you have to ignore those signals. Whereas uh, females, in a, a lot of times, they end up listening to those signals. They've got that in intuition and they're saying, well, I'm not feeling so good. I'm going to go and look for help, right? And so the the mainstream um, um, statistics look at, okay, well, females are going and getting mental health support and they they are now more at risk than males, right? And I'm saying that that, that information is absolutely wrong. If you look at our statistics in in uh, in my eHealth, when we can go in and we can look at the parameters that are actually causing uh, mental health, and uh, this will also be supported by if you look at the the drug use and the um, the um, uh, suicide rates of uh, men and uh, opposed to women, then we find a, a, different types of statistics. If you look at motivation, females actually in our results show that females are three have three. 0.09% higher motivation than males. Stress, stress males have 4.52% more stress than females. Uh, when it comes to burnout, males have 4.74% higher rates of burnout than females. General anxiety of 7.31% higher for males than females. And if you look at depression, it's actually 10.56% higher. So why is this again? It's because of the stigma. It's the misconception that you're looking at between men and women. Everybody's thinking it's actually it's the other way around. As I said, self-awareness, your ability to connect with these signals in yourself and actually listen to them and say, hey, I need a, I need a pause. Something's going on. And then you've got also the hunter gatherer. You can say uh, modern human versus evolution and the demands, right? The implosion of time and space. Everybody has to work harder. Um, 
You've got to work longer hours. You've got to perform more tasks. Efficiency and lean models have become the primary dominating factor running a company and not your biological needs. So understanding some of these things and how they trigger and how they work together within that environment are really important as part of this demand then goes into solutions to preventive solutions. Next slide. Well explained, Laura and Clive. Let us know from Laura, what are the benefits of remote delivery therapy for mental health? Thanks, Swati. So I would like to talk about the service that I had at Teladoc Health UK in Ireland. We have these services specialised in telephone delivery therapy. And I must admit, at the personal level, it has been such an amazing opportunity because um, a lot of people might question, you know, uh, in terms of video therapy, why not to alternate? What we have found is that it's always best to follow whatever the client feels uh, it's most appropriate for them. But with clients that chose telephone therapy, we found that they opened up tremendously. You know, it was almost a sense of intimacy when you don't need to look at the person, when you don't see their reactions. And, and it's only about talking and sensing these changes on the tone and in the pitch that indicate different emotions that one should explore. Um, we focus on individuals who struggle with mainstream mental health, and, and by that I mean mild to moderate mental health conditions, and we work worldwide with individuals coming from anywhere. Uh, we deliver brief courses of therapy of up to 10 sessions in some cases, and we use an integrative and holistic approach to therapy. This is to say that whatever the needs of the clients are, we find them, we assess them, and you know, like a shoe, we tailor make it to them. Um, and in a previous uh, meeting, I was telling Clive that uh, I heard this saying, and it's always stuck to me, which is that when you have a hammer, uh, everything looks like a nail. And so we believe that in psychological therapy, we should be uh, applying different varieties to be able to tailor make these interventions. And so uh, the team is composed by psychologists, counselors, and psychotherapists. Next slide. So in order to understand the impact of this telephone therapy that we are delivering, we, we wanted to measure and do a study. And so, first of all, I wanted to show you the growth that the company has experienced simply since January until now. This is the number of sessions that we are providing, which is signaling already an increase in demand for this sort of support uh, for clients. Next slide, please. And so what we did is that we asked our, our clients to complete a questionnaire. It's called the CORE 10. This is internationally validated outcome measure that basically establishes the general sense of well-being of the person. It has 10 questions and it assesses different elements of mental health, including suicidal thoughts. What we found is that before these brief courses of therapy, um, most of our population sat in the middle. There was 17.5% of people who were on the healthy zone with either very low problems or being healthy. We found in the moderate zone uh, to mild zone, 54% of our sample and finally, in the individuals who were sadly really struggling with their mental health, displaying moderately to severe mental health uh, difficulties, there was 20, 28% of the sample. Um, and so what happens is that, you know, we were able to see very, very good results. I would like to say that this is a sample of 554 uh, completed cases of therapy. And so after that, about 71% was in that healthy zone, 25% uh, on the moderate and 3.4% on the severe. Next slide. Similarly to what Clive have found, you know, also we see that females feel more able to come and seek therapy. And it was about 68% of our females that, you know, came forward. And so again, uh, you know, how are you going to be talking about masculinity and mental health is a big topic and how you're going to bring it into the company. Um, next slide. So that it would be for Clive. Thank you. That was very insightful, Laura. What would you say, Clive? What are the challenges for the new entrants in the mental health devices market? Well, thanks, uh, Swati and Laura. Uh, well, let, 
this slide will obviously lead into some of the other slides on how we're actually doing it. But the challenges of entering into the the uh, the market are really quite large. First, it's the lack of legislation to require preventive solutions. Regulations are antiquated, and supporting retroactive business mo business uh, models run. Uh, anything that's retroactive is more expensive. But as we know, governments are really slow to move. Uh, they're usually the dinosaur or in the room or the elephant in the room, if you want to say that. And it always takes a long time for them to move forward, right? Lack of government-sponsored initiatives uh, to promote pre uh, prevention wave. Uh, this could be done very easily if the government wanted to support a prevention wave. You could uh, create incentives, which I'll talk about in another slide. Scalability is uh, one of the big concerns that you've got when you uh, when you enter in the market. R and D costs and financing. R and D is one huge topic when it comes to mental health because it's not like selling a Coca Cola. You are actually talking about mental health, and it's a composite problem of all sorts of parameters that affect somebody's uh, ability to engage in work and life and 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 to, and to feel good. Distribution channels are another. Uh, the good thing about the online environment is that, just like Laura said, we international, we can go anywhere. We can follow our customers wherever they are. Time zones don't mean anything anymore. Um, the uh, the distribution channels, unfortunately, in the uh, in the logistical side, are usually owned by the big players in the market, and these are insurance companies controlling obviously their markets in uh, with ineffective retroactive products and solutions that usually fit their their business retroactive model, obviously. Tender policies when it comes to entering the market, if you want to do business with cities and governments, that's also another archaic type process on how to get the job because the cheapest is definitely not the best. And and uh, you then provide in a subservice because some people are going out there and trying to sell a mental health app uh, for $2 a month, right? And there's just nobody that can provide mental health at $2 a month, especially if you're highly stressed or if you've got anxiety. There's no way you're going to read 20 pages or 50 pages on, on what's going to make you feel better. You need to talk to a person one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, face to face with someone that can actually help you and uh, reading something because we are not in the avatar area uh, um, arena yet where you can actually have a, f a physical discussion with avatars, which we would like to do anyway in the future, but we're not there yet. Apps versus real people, this is, this is the whole thing, is when can, how you can integrate people wherever they might be in this uh, hybrid community that we are now, where people can work from distance. That means we can create more access and uh, availability. Next slide, please. Um, so a part of the emerging part is what we want to do is we there are many good uh, well-being apps on the market today and this is a very good and it's a positive thing it means the awareness is there and now people are rushing to get to this market however there is a problem and that's there's a lack of reliability and validity on the with these tools so it's an important thing when you're going to buy an instrument and you're going to buy something do you have validity do you have the, an, enough clinical trials and uh, the statistics that can give you a statistically significant uh, result when you're measuring something and also when you you perform in rehab and positive services. There are very few, unfortunately, actors in the market that have that. I'm proud to say that I know Teladoc has it and I, I, know, I know we have it. Um, Maybe the, uh, the online services could even be looking at, uh, you know, things like uh, what's your relapse rate? Right. If you went to a traditional clinic and you asked them what's your relapse rate, I bet you'd be a lot, a lot different to what our relapse rates are. Um, and or you can say, what's the success rate? Uh, costs. You and again, as I said before, between the app and and the uh, uh, and the one-on-one, -on -one, it's you get what you pay for. If you want to buy cheap, you're going to get a cheap service. Um, and you're not going to get this holistic approach, which is going to look in all the, at all the causal and the symptomatic solutions that are required. Next slide, please. So at My eHealth, what we try to do really is we try to provide somebody an environment, uh, an online environment, where which we call My Private Space. And this private space obviously is WebRTC uh, um, uh, run. That means that you don't have, all you need is a Chromium-based uh, web browser and you can surf into this uh, when you log out, no information saved, and uh, we keep everything on the cloud 
and away from uh, any actors. Uh, messages in the uh, we uh, and and journals, everything's kept in the system. We don't mail anything to anybody. You might get an email that says you need to log on to your account because there's uh, there's there's uh, there's uh, some information there for you, or a letter or something. Uh, so what we try to really to do is we try to create a holistic picture of the services that an individual might need. And that we refer to as a multimodal group. So when we give them a platform that's secure with, with access to an, uh, many digital uh, um, solutions, and then we, we have some assessments which we use, we actually do on a quarterly basis. We don't do assessments on a weekly basis or a daily basis because that's too intrusive and it doesn't work. As soon as you start trying to get somebody to answer an app every single day on how you're feeling, how you're feeling, how you're feeling, the first week after 14 days of use, they're going to stop using it. So you have to find that equilibrium and the balance between what are we trying to measure and, and how effectively can we measure it and how far or what is the distance between that, uh, the periods where, that we need to be able to find this information so that we can proactively work to prevent it from growing. Because any mental health challenge has its challenges in itself. It actually grows uh, when there's no help. So waiting 16 weeks to meet a psychologist or a health coach is just crazy because what you're doing is you're just creating a bigger hole. And, and uh, it's just harder to, to, uh, to treat. The longer somebody waits for treatment, the harder it gets to, to actually proactively or, or to, to treat it, to rehab it. Then we create self, we've got self-awareness uh, assessments and uh, 360 assessments, mindfulness, self-help uh, areas. You get access, you can say the spider in the web in our triage, you can say is the wellness coach. The wellness coach always has, is the first person that somebody always talks to. Uh, and that person has some CBT background and, and, and uh, nutrition and all that kind of stuff. And then you've got mindfulness and structure, which you can connect into the team. You can connect a psychologist, a CBT therapist, but it doesn't have to be a CBT therapist because we practice actually mixed methods. That means that you use, as Laura said, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? And that's not the case when you come to, for instance, my health or Teladoc. What we do is we... We, we ad adapt our service and our offering to your needs. And that's really important by turning this around. Everybody in the world is talking about a pa patient-centric or employee-centric system, right? We have that. And we've been pra practicing that for, for years now, uh, where the, the patient comes in or the, the employee comes in and the employee can decide what they need and, they can, and we empower them to take that, that, that uh, step. Uh, next slide, please. So part of that, I just showed you the environment for the individual when they come into our system. But then the next step you've got is you've got actually an environment for the caregiver. If you're a doctor or a psychotherapist, health coach, you need to get an, a, an actionable um, operator's window, you can say, of the people within my, my, my uh, care team. So if you've got five people in a care team, that means those five people get access to the information, no one else. Uh, and you get access to those five, uh, the patients that are in your workflow, and then you can, or the individuals in your workflow, right? And that means that you can you can see in with, in our system, you can see an overall uh, picture of their situational uh, wellness. You can see what their motivation is. You can see their stress levels. You can see their defense routines, uh, their their uh, burnout, uh, GAD, which is general anxiety disorder, depression. You can see how engaged they are, and you can see the different different seven environments of what's affecting their ability to to actually work within their environment. All of this is so important in helping to understand the situation a person's in before you even meet them online. So when we meet someone online and we, we can have a, a direct focus of where we should be helping straight away before we even start the first discussion, because we know those parameters and we, 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 we've understood a number of solutions that can help people within, within these scenarios. So that's a, a, quite an important part. We can sometimes save 10, 10 uh, therapy sessions or even 20 therapy sessions by getting this information up front. Next slide, please. 
part of the uh, the information that we've got is if somebody goes into therapy and they need to get some some additional services then what we we try to do is when we measure them and if we're going to do a cbt or or dbt or act or or any one of the uh, the, the the branches of psychology positive psychology transpersonal psychology uh, psychodynamic or any one that you want you still need to get this basic information up front by having this solid information up front and understanding the person within that environment, whether it's delusional or not, doesn't matter. It's to understand where's the starting point, where should I be looking, what should I be addressing. Then you can address that and then you use the tools which we have in our system. We actually are, we were the first ones in the world to come up with a inter, fully integrated CBT uh, actionable program where you can interact with the patient doing these things at the same time as they're as they, with you. So we're trying to bring in cognitive uh, um, uh, cognition into the picture and uh, understanding cognitive distortions and, and things like that. Um, we can look at histories with the individual. So it's not that, that we just measure you once. If we measure every quarter, we can see how you are during the year. We can see a trend, whether that trend means that you're getting, you're getting worse or you're getting better. What's happened with rehab? Are you improving during your rehab? And that's also important, not just for the individual, to understand that I'm actually making progress. I'm not going to the psychologist once a week, every week, and I don't know if I'm getting better. Uh, by being able to measure some of these factors, they can see this, and it helps to propel their uh, their uh, you can say march to to uh, wellness. Uh, next slide. So, in addition to all of that, since you, I think you've understood, is we focus on uh, uh, um, uh, companies and and employee employee well being because uh, that's forty eight percent of the the population. And within that, what we try to do is we try to provide also where well, we do provide companies with an aggregate report based on what is the distribution risk that a company might have, how many people are at low uh, um, or no evidence of burnout and, and uh, low risk or a moderate risk or high risk. And are there any people in, in burnout? Uh, are these people in therapy or they're not in therapy? Uh, and and um, uh, depends on what the company contract has with us, if they want us to measure it and treat and uh, individuals, then we do that automatically when they get into a, a, a moderate or high risk for, for um, uh, being uh, go going on sick leave, right? So we can prevent sick leave because we can identify it way before it actually happens. That's a huge advantage, uh, not just for the company, but for the employee and everyone concerned connected to that, that individual. It keeps uh, uh, continuity in place and it keeps uh, uh, the team dynamics also working within a company. Uh, this kind of platform that we have here, we present to the boardrooms every quarter. So if they have a... a um, a contract with my health and what we do is we go out and we uh, uh, we'll do the analysis we'll write a report we'll present uh, both a written report and a powerpoint to the the board of directors so uh, their agendas always have a point company mental health and company well-being and then they get our full report and that means that the board of directors actually has information that they can work with uh, not just that is that if we've been doing anything with them, we actually can write, we can, we can, we can uh, measure that uh, because we can measure pres presenteeism directly within our, our, um, our framework. So you don't have to go to Boston Consulting or to McKinsey or some of these, some of these actors out there and get them to, to, um, to do a report for you. This is automatically presented to you in, uh, with Mighty Health. And you can see your return on investment as well. If you spent a certain amount of money, how much how, uh, has it improved and how much have we saved? Uh, next slide, please. So I'm bringing Sweden to the picture here for you because uh, preventive uh, um, prevention is something I've been talking about quite a lot lately. But companies spend literally billions of dollars on uh, um, sustainability and figuring out preventive maintenance uh, issues and where they need to do it on their machines, right? That's all. Everyone knows it. Same thing. You sit in your car and the, the lamp comes on and says, oh, change your engine. Or, or change oil, you go and change oil, right? But what are people doing for the unseen personnel burden and challenges that people have with their mental health within the organization? How are you doing that, right? And, and what are the steps that the companies are doing? 
I think and I believe personally that governments should go out and they should be offering a two to one uh, tax reduction for every every dollar you spend. You should get two dollars in tax reduction. Why? Because it's good for the, the government and it's good for the company. And it's it's a proactive approach that that the government should be sponsoring uh, preventive care for all its uh, its uh, citizens. Right. Uh, um, Sweden was actually first in the world to come out with a uh, a law um, through through the uh, Occupation and Health Environment uh, Services, where it's an actual law that you have to every company has to measure the psychosocial health and well-being of their employees. That's the company's responsibility, uh, and this actually I think is very good because if that is used and this is used as a model throughout the world, what can happen is that 48% of that the mental health that we have in the world, uh, we will be able to find that within the company since 48% are, are employed. And if you can find that and we can proactively treat and prevent these issues, that means that the public health and the mental services within all the countries uh, will be able to actually deal with that onslaught of, of uh, uh, the onslaught and the demand that's out there. But together, the companies have, the, the governments have failed in this. And this is why they need the support of private actors like My Health and Teladoc and, and the other actors out there in the market today. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a good union to be made there. And um, uh, yeah, great. Uh, thank you very much. Next slide. Thank you, all the speakers, for your valuable insights on mental health wellness in a post pandemic world. After your inputs, I can say that impact of COVID-19 pandemic has enhanced the access to mental health services, including early assessment, treatment, and psychosocial support screening and support for specific group to mitigate the impact of economic recession on mental health and addressing stigma during the pandemic are paramount in addressing the problem. With that thought, let me conclude today's session, following which I now declare the forum open for any questions from the listeners. So we have our first question. The biggest issue and probably Rather, a subdued one is that children have been facing a lot of difficulty in expressing themselves. They can't really do that with their parents and act as carefree as they can be with their peer group. What can be done to elevate this? Even if parents act as friends, there's still a sustain, sustainable level to, of comfort that a child has with people of the same age. What can be done on this thing? Absolutely. Clive, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. Judy, go ahead, Laura. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 it's such a good question, so well formulated. Um, you know what? I think that children are going to start developing within themselves, you know, I, I, I hear this and I know it's a long distance from what we say and, but as an only child, I think I had a lot of that. You spent a lot of time with yourself, you learn to think, to entertain yourself. And I think the parents should be a key figures in, in supporting that, you know. Um, and then of course, there's going to be a period of adaptation by which, you know, coming back to what their life used to be, they'll have to adapt to feeling perhaps a little bit more anxious than they would have if they would have been around the friends all the time so I think that you know be honest with your own children about how the pandemic affects you at times you know well, what has it been like to be at home be open with them be frank with them so that they can be open with you that doesn't mean that you need to be their friend you can put boundaries and those are necessary for them not to grow up spoiled I, I've got something I'd like to add to that Laura if I may the uh, the online environment that we in is just a fantastic environment, right? All the kids today are growing up with, well, not all the kids, but the lucky kids are growing up with with iPads and and these kinds of things where they can interact, right? So I believe uh, a system like 
Dell Doc and, and my eHealth that has um, that has an interactive system where children can go and they can get the support they need if they feel that they they're being bullied or they feel that that things aren't right for them. Obviously, they should be talking to their parents, they should be talking to the teachers and things. That, but sometimes these things fall through the cracks and they don't they don't help. Right? We could have a system online that could measure d- dyslexia. Absolutely. If somebody uh, has a problem at school and we, we can find out pretty easily uh, to measure dyslexia or online. And so some of these complications, ADHD and all these other things, these things could be measured and, and be supported online. They, they, again, it should be uh, this is unfortunately up to the governments to uh, uh, and to the charities out there to figure out how they would like to support environments like ours and, and, and yours in, in order to to help the children in this, because uh, uh, usually the schools don't have the money, the money to to do that. Absolutely. Great. So the next question is, what are the challenges in implementing digital mental health offerings for the masses in emerging countries? Well, do you want to take that, Laura? <laughs> I, 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 can I can take, take it, but I'll let you go first if you want. I can, I can take that too. Well, the challenges obviously is is going to be um, um, to create that awareness and the uh, the interest that this is a solution where, where they can find it. So that is unfortunately when you're going out to the the uh, the the public then that requires deep pockets. It requires a lot of advertising. It requires uh, informational channel channels where this this environment can or the solution can be actually delivered to them. The news media communications that needs to spread around the world to actually show this is a place where you can go and get help. Um, and until that information is actually spread logically and effectively around the world, and especially in the low income areas, then uh, that's going to be very difficult, right? We were we we have some companies that that have created um, an e-health room. So that means that when you come to work, there's actually an e-health room that they can go into, and then they can connect with w- with us, and then that is all secluded, and they can go there, and it's just normal for everybody to come to the e-health room. Why is because it's just a common place. We all get in our quarterly feedback there, whether I'm sick or not. It's my quarterly feedback with my health coach. And so it's normal to see people coming in and out of that room. So it's not stigmatized in any way. So that's a solution could be done. You could have, uh, you know, e-health booths all over the place that people can go to and access if if uh, this is made available to them. So the, we're in a really fantastic time in life where the opportunities are just uh, enormous in order to to fulfill this this demand which i think both laura and i clearly uh, um, sh- uh, showed earlier in the presentation that that the need is just way beyond uh, our abilities Absolutely. laura you go ahead try and yeah. Uh, yeah 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 no actually i'm very surprised because i had uh, basically the same point which is uh, i'm sort of thinking back at the initiatives that i see in, in relation to what we call digital exclusion and um, very interestingly the national health service in the uk as well one of the uh, mild moderate mental health condition services there the iaps um they sort of uh, established digital pots so people again that didn't have the means to have a mobile phone that didn't have the internet capacity or whatever to access the therapy could come into the hospital and just have that moment of privacy even though the psychologists were at home or the other practitioners were at home so yeah second that great so can you tell us or provide us your suggestions regarding maintaining a work-life balance <laughs> <laughs> you could start on that and I'll fill in off. That's a fun one too. <laughs> um, you know what? I think uh, listen to yourself. That's the most important bit I can give you. I think we're so good at ignoring 
things that ache, things that bother us, you know, it's better just not to say something. So, I mean, delimit the boundaries of your life. If you are working 10 hours a day and your back hurts and you're moody when it comes to being with your loved ones and you don't even have a sexual drive anymore because this is what you do, and then stop it, you know, reduce it, uh, acknowledge your limits. You are not meant to be a machine. So I think that that's it. And create little habits, just really, really little ones that you can certainly attain and implement to your routine. You know, do you need to be breathing twice a day, just a few minutes, just to slow down? Um, do you need to be eating a little bit better? You know, maybe don't have that second or third ice cream where you were meant to stop. Um, things that make you feel good and take control. Um, okay, you... that I love that answer. And I'm going to add a few little cool bites to that and that is i'm going to start with with something that, that i say like what you're doing firstly mm -hmm. if you don't like what you're doing and maybe it's time to consider moving on or moving somewhere so like what you're doing if you're in a situation and you're very uncomfortable try to improve that situation empower yourself to do something out of that and then as uh, the self-awareness absolutely if you don't have self-awareness half the problem is going to be going to be there Right. As soon as your self-awareness is there, that means you're at least aware of these things. Um, your meaning and identity in the things that you're doing with work and life. What's important to you? you we know nutrition is important. We know that that uh, uh, family contact and with one another is important, friends and socialization. Um, and no matter who uh, you are, everyone needs someone to be able to uh, uh, talk to and uh, joke and laugh with and things like that. So there is always someone out there for you if you don't have that person right now. There is always someone that you can find. Uh, and um, yeah, it, to find that balance, it, again, it's there's a really fantastic, now I'm thinking of it, a Swedish saying that the Vikings used to have. And this is a cool thing, actually, a little nugget for you all to take with you down. Uh, see if you want to think back in the Viking times, right? There's a saying in Sweden called logom. And logom is, there's just no word for it in English. So try and take this word with you, logom, right? But what it was is the Vikings would be sitting around a fire and then they would have a certain a limited amount of food. And then they would say, okay, well, hand the food around. So you just take just as much as what you need so that it can go all the way around the team. Logom runt, right? is in, in Sweden. So it's a really cool, uh, cool thing to take with that. And that's in proportion. You know, if you like what you're doing and you love it, do it in proportion. Take, if you like French fries, well, you can eat French fries, but you don't have to be a fanatic in anything, right? It's, it's not good to too much on it, on anything. It's just find a balance. Sorry. I'm got carried away again. <laughs> Great. So the next question is, which areas can mental health care services providers focus on in deciding their offerings in the future? Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Which area can mental health care service providers focus on in deciding their offerings in the future? Oh, this is a really fun one too. You want to take that, Laura, or you want me to take that one? You take that one. I'll go after that. <laughs> okay. Hey, the mental health arena is just a fantastic uh, arena. And uh, I guess everyone that's here thinks the same way because you wouldn't be here if, if you didn't think that way. I believe the future is going to entail uh, virtual reality. It's going to have augmented reality. It's going to have uh, avatars. It's going to have treatment rooms for people with P design, specially designed treatment rooms for people with PTSD, with uh, all sorts of other types of stresses. And you can take people to within these environments and you can though physically both with an avatar and with a human interact within this environment and to, to practice certain things. I think that's going to be a really cool development for mental health in the future. But I still believe everything that we're doing, the grassroots stuff that Laura and myself are doing and, and on the front lines, that's mm -hmm. really important. Mm -hmm. You remember these things are these things are that you said the future, right? That's where I think the future will go. I think you know, people will absolutely come into that domain in the future. Um, but right now it's still the grassroots stuff. We need more people in this 
business. So people should go into the mental health. Uh, uh, more schools should be should be uh, teaching uh, um, um, well-being and uh, I- including you know uh, CBT and all the other branches and nutrition and everything together. Absolutely, um, really good response, Clark. Um I think that you know. Um, I don't really know what the future will look like. Uh, I, I I wonder. I know where I would take uh, my service and where do I think it will be a good space. But I think that's something that worries me about that future that you talked about, Clyde, is how immersed we're going to be with technology. You know, we're <laughs> heading in that direction and we don't really know how it's going to change us because it certainly will uh yeah. you know as someone that works uh, you know five days a week in front of a laptop i know it is changing it so i'm i'm just curious as the same as the person that asked uh, you know what would happen mindful walks for instance we have one of our treatment things in rehab we we everyone gets a prescription well, not everyone but those in rehab they get a prescription or in preventive solutions they get we give them prescription of a mindful walk where they've got to like break down and do and practice different senses during this walk right and it's a really cool thing to declutter and get out all of that stuff right so you know the the digital world doesn't have to be restrained to that you can you you can i think we it's here to stay and I think we've got to marriage that with, okay, now it's time to go and do your mindful walk, right? And do that kind of thing out in the thing. Uh, so I don't know. I think it's, we, we, we've got to find that, uh, yeah, we'll find that balance. It's just, they need people like you and I to argue those points. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So could you please elaborate on the challenges faced by the clinical therapist during the pandemic what are the ways that you could suggest in overcoming them? Mm. So I, I think if I'm correct, that sort of relates to the slide when I was talking a little bit about, you know, what it had been for me, but also for, for the team that I work with. I think that, you know, there's a new reinforcement on how do we support each other as practitioners. We make a teledoc a massive emphasis on having those spaces. You know, we're starting to develop a peer supervision group. We have weekly meetings. We reach out out of each other in teams. And for me, that's such an interesting experience as well. You know, where there's some webinars really interesting about uh, digital body language that when I started, I thought, okay, I think I know how to put myself in front of the camera. But it was nothing to do with that. It's about how we use language to communicate emotion and to form groups digitally. So I think that we're all learning these ways of keeping a a sense of belonging within teams that really, really help. Also to have support so that if the practitioner feels like they've had a difficult session, they can, you know, immediately just send an email who can have a chat with me. And you have your moment of debrief, of connecting to what you feel, um, and also regular breaks in between clients. I think um, for many people's experiences, myself included, if I put many clients on a row, it comes to the last one and you feel a bit spaced out, not, not remembering what you should, not operating as you should. And so we ensure that they have that time to sort of debrief, relax, ground themselves as we encourage our clients to do, and then be open for the next person to come. Yeah. So um, that's what I would say. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we uh, intervisions we do also on a weekly basis. And if you're in a, in, in a multimodal team, then who, whichever team you might be in, because that could be uh, that could vary who's in the the, the team. Uh, then uh, you can bring up uh, um, issues and challenges that you might have both as a therapist or, or a, a psychologist or a health coach. And uh, by having that support within that team, that means you're not alone. So you, even although you might be remote and you might be one person might be in. Uh, in the Arctic and uh, and the other in the Antarctica, right? You you would still be able to have this intervision with each other, where where you can you can exchange both knowledge with the with uh, with the person. But I think when you when it comes to the patient side, to the individual side, that's also quite important that the environment can access their visual cortex, because if you want to have change, then you need that cogwheel to click. And you needed to start turning right. And when you, the, I think the 
the the most rewarding thing as a as a, as a psychologist or and and a therapist I I would say is when that when you see the patient sees and the and and the penny drops and the cog wheel just and it starts to turn and when that starts to turn you think oh man fantastic right because you know now they're on the road to their path they've seen it they see this they, their d dissonance is now gone right and they can see the clarity of black and white and and this is the way that they want to go forward and and the distortions that might be there and how they interact with that so i think th this is uh, um to provide that environment for the patient is really important and uh, which i think makes us feel good on this side is because we we want to uh, we want to see that happen. Great. The last question would be: While it is great to define mental health in positive ways, what about emphasizing the positive side of mental health solutions to the many challenges of increasing mental illness? Uh, can you read that one more time? Sure. <laughs> While it is great to define mental health in positive ways, what about emphasizing the positive side of mental health solutions to the many challenges of increasing mental health illness? Well, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that. <laughs> I'm not sure I got it all there. I'm going to do my best at responding that. I think that there was in relation to why do we struggle to frame it positively? Is that is that the question, Claire? No, I think it was first, why do you frame it? In, we've said the positive things and then how is the positive things towards the challenges, I think. Okay, I thought it, was like, it was like a double positive. Um, uh, can you read it a third time and then we'll try and answer it? <laughs> <laughs> sure, Clive. While it is great to define mental health in positive ways, mm. what about emphasizing the positive side of mental health solutions to the many challenges of increasing mental illness? To increasing mental illness. So this, the person who has asked the question is saying, Clive, you are on uh, onto it. So what you are thinking is the right point. Good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I'll start there. And this is one thing that we do is when people take an analysis with us, we don't provide uh, uh, anyone with their, a risk uh, analysis until uh, we actually meet them online. Uh, when we've, uh, if somebody, they'll see uh, the basic results, but they won't see how that leads to a, um, uh, and risk exposure to burnout, for instance, am I moderately exposed to burnout, or am I a high risk, or or uh, uh, or do I have a high risk of anxiety, and these kinds of things. So these risks le risk levels which we assess, we don't want to uh, we don't divulge that to the patient because we don't want to make the patient sick. We want to make the patients better, right? So the the unfortunate thing with cognitive dissonance and cognitive distortion is that especially in cognitive distortions if you want to talk cbt right you can have a catastrophizer so if you have a patient coming in and they're a catastrophizer and you don't know it because you haven't met them yet and then they see too much data or too much stuff from these these apps that don't have the validity and they don't have as i'm saying validity and reliability are really keys so if they don't have that information and they then autom automatically see this stuff, and then they will start catastrophizing, meaning, oh, it's a big mountain. I'm dying. I, and they will make the worst out of that scenario, right? So it's our, it's our responsibility as, uh, on this side as, as psychologists and, and psychotherapists to make sure that, and health coaches, to make sure that you can ease somebody into a solution so that solution would be best fit, will will also or or we can find that solution that best fits them without leading them down or making things worse right because sometimes um people are happy in denial or delusion right and they don't want to come out of that um but it's it it depends on how that affects also the environment that they're in remember there's an old saying that you used to have that um, ignorance is bliss right yeah sure it is unless that ignorance is then hurting other people around you so 
where's that, again, that balance and where's that responsibility? Obviously, if you're hurting other people around you, then that, 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 that bliss that you've got is actually not good, right? Uh, and a, um, I, I, I don't know. You can fill on that, Laura. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, that's such a um, key moment, right? And, and a key skill to have as a therapist is to understand how much can you mirror to this person what is happening currently in their life? How honest can you be with them in that moment so that they they can take it? They they have gained, you know, and that's why you work on building the skills first, right? And then almost revealing now you're ready to take it. So, um, yeah, very delicate art. And unfortunately, as, as Clive and myself, we have the tools to evaluate it and we have the people to have the conversations when needed and said, OK, see, this is the progress or this is how things are affecting you. Great. Unfortunately, we have now run out of time. In the end, I would like to thank all of the speakers for joining us in this session. With the help of speakers, we will try to answer these questions and send them across through mails. In case you wish to contact the speakers directly, you may reach out to them at the given email addresses. To understand more about the capabilities, market intelligence studies, and related reports to mental health, you can visit our website. We have got awesome responses through registrations and questions. With this, I conclude today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, and I wish you all a wonderful week ahead. Thank you all very much, and it was lovely being with you, with you all here tonight. Same here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.